Welcome to another episode of Last Night A Rave Saved My Life brought to you by yours truly, aka Nico the Beardo. In this episode, I speak to a student I know and have worked with for a long time, telling me about his experiences of graduating during lockdown and the challenges he faces that might resonate with a lot of students out there right now. Welcome, Justy. How are you, bro? Uh, I'm good, man. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad. So, explain uh, who you are and your relation to B-Swang. Okay, so... I am, I guess, still a B-Swang rep. I mean, like, not a lot's been going on with that for a <laughs> yeah. while. Um, but in terms of my relationship with B-Swang, yeah, I started repping for them, like, must be like four years ago now. 2016. I'd probably say, like, you're the longest standing rep, potentially. I think No, I think I am. I'm most I am. consistent. Yeah, it's me, then Max. I've got the right person on the show. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so 2016, um... I knew a couple of people in Leicester already, like when I came to uni and someone was like, oh yeah, this beast fang, it's sick. Went, loved it. And then the next day I got a message saying like, do you want to rep? And which, oh, it was, I know which one you first went to because it was the music cafe one. Yeah, yeah. It was yeah. a residence only. Yeah. Night. So it was a residence only night and it was our first beast fang at music cafe and yeah. Josty was there experiencing it for the first time. Loved it. <laughs> loved it. <laughs> loved it so much it became a rep. Yeah. And he's been a rep ever since. And uh, tell me about uni and B Swang and how being involved in the underground music scene in Leicester, like, explain a bit about um, how it's maybe shaped you or your experiences. Yeah. Um, funny enough, I had a conversation about this recently with, with an old friend. Um, and so I think it was like perfect for me. It helped me like find that like being involved in Beast Wang, find like me as a person. Um, and so this old friend I was having this conversation with was saying like before I went to uni, um, I was sort of like my own person, but I hadn't like come out of my shell and that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And then he said like every time he saw me since, I was talking about, you know, this rave and that and like doing yeah. this. And, it, and like Beast Wang is like, like we were just saying, it's like a collective and mm. it just really helps you like surround yourself with like-minded people. And up until that point, I hadn't had that. Yeah. And then I had that like, and it just like opened me up into this whole new world of like amazing people. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's so sick. I think that's how it was always meant to be. I mean, it's different from kind of where it is right now, but I started it when I was 22 yeah. and I used to meet, imagine when I kind of came into it or just before I came into it, there wasn't really an underground music scene yeah. in this stuff. Like when I mean, there wasn't like, you had probably uh John first playing some Big type up. of bass music He's in, a legend in Softbeck the scene. Uh, called Drop, and that was as much as we had. And just before that, you had um, a club's call Superfly. You had DJSS putting on formation nights, but I think that was just as I just as I started getting into it. I think that's when these events stopped maybe just a couple of years before me. So there was like a short time frame where there wasn't really anything going on in Leicester. And when I used to meet students. I used to see them not being able to connect with anything or they didn't really know where to align themselves in the world of nightlife. And one of the things that I wanted to bring to Leicester was, was of course, like I wanted to bring underground music to Leicester and experience it. But I think it was about bringing like-minded individuals together to connect and kind of form some kind of community. So let's say, for example, um, we started off by maybe bringing in 50 people from University of Leicester, 50 people from DMU. And that's just how it started. And maybe a few Leicester locals that were my friends as well. And then we got just over 100 people on the first night. So I think it's like that element of um, bringing people together or students together mainly mm. is one of the reasons why I wanted to start B-Song. But yeah, carry it, wor it worked perfectly. Like, and it was such a community. And I think a good sort of like, not quote, but another conversation I had recently. Um, so I met my current girlfriend at B-Swang mm -hmm. and we were like sort of, thinking back and she said she remembers one of the first beast fangs and we all walked it was at too funky and um i was like walking around holding a hand and she was like everyone was just stopping saying hello to me and she was like i thought you were like a celebrity you knew like you knew everyone <laughs> and i obviously that that wasn't me like that was nothing to do with me it was just because beast fang was such a community like you'd go there and you'd know everyone yeah, yeah, yeah. and that just sums it up perfectly i think like it was it was, it was amazing yeah it's like i felt i've always wanted it to be more than just a club like that so 
Uh, it's one thing that I've been thinking about in lockdown, actually, like, what do we stand for as a brand? Because B-Swang is getting bigger where we're getting into the, the thousands now. And I feel like you lose that part of connection sometimes and you feel that at that big of events. And I, what I want to try to do is claw back that community vibe and thinking about how can we bring that together? And I think one way of bringing that together, even on a bigger sc- scale, is letting people know what you stand for and letting people know your values. So... Um, we haven't really committed it too too much, but yeah, because events are not back on. But I've been toying around with the idea of maybe committing to only a certain amount of big events a year. So it's like, right, we'll only do uh, two big events a year, maybe one festival, and all the rest. If we do do events, they're all going to be small shows. You're talking like 300 capacity shows, and that's where you build. Like, there's nothing like being in a room where. Um, as a DJ as well, like you're able to play what you want, when you want and uh, put in some kind of musical journey together for the listener or the customer Definitely. dancing their night away. And what you do is when you have that connection with people or the audience, that's what ties them into the brand. That's what ties them into you. And that's what builds that bigger community over the long run. Um, I think anyway, yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, I think that sums it up. I feel like there's like two types of customers. You've got the customer that's like really into the music or they're just out there just to get completely smashed. <laughs> and that's about as far as it goes. They're not really that into the music. And it's like, I want to focus on the ones that are really into the music because I feel like they're going to be those long-term followers when mm. even after uni, they still want to be involved in the brand. They want to know what our artists are releasing and things like that. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the big events are still great. Like they're obviously good to get you out there, but it's those smaller ones that you can really feel like the that spirit, that community spirit that goes on. Mm. I think that's probably the right way to go. Maybe. I think so. But yeah, so um, spoke about uni experiences, how it's uh, helps you connect with people, like friends from both unis, for example. I, I yeah. assume. Um, yeah, I met people from uni of Leicester. I think my first boost line was going with people from uni of Leicester and I was from DMU. So like, okay. that was a big thing. Met so many people, like countless people that I still speak to yeah. to this day. Like, and like Edmonton Road parties, met them a lot through Boost Wang. I remember those actually. Yeah. <laughs> just like those basement parties. I used to DJ down. So there used to be a house a house on Edmonton Road at the top and it used to have a basement and we got adv- uh, me, PJ got invited to DJ at one. Uh, with a bunch of students and it was so sick it reminded me of like so back in the day when I was 21 22 yeah. I used to go to house parties in Sheffield and honestly like, these house parties were different like I used to think this was amazing and I always felt like Leicester never really had house parties like that just had to find them no I still don't think <laughs> I had them like that not like honestly if you went if you went to these ones in Sheffield just uh, the next level like people were bringing like big sound systems like it was just mad that was one. This was actually a close friends of mine's house. There were so many people in the living room, the floor caved in. <laughs> <laughs> That's how bad it was. Mad. All right, yeah, okay. Like, it was just, yeah, it was just a mazza. But yeah, like, that was probably the closest one to it, this Evanston Road p- party. Yeah. So if you're listening and you was there, you know what it is, you know what time it was. It was a bad boy night. Um, but yeah, going back to your experiences and it's obviously led you to the whole theme of this podcast is graduating during lockdown and what i wanted to speak about was um the start of lockdown i.e around march and those couple of months what you've done during lockdown um and where you're currently at right now so in terms of the start of lockdown like did you you talked to me through about that like did you stay in Leicester like what actually happened because it was around March time that yeah, it was like lockdown happened end of March wasn't it like 20, 20 something of March um, yeah, so I was did you have exams in, like I don't really know how it works as well so um, did you have exams did you have deadlines like did you have dissertations to hand in yeah so yeah it was something like towards the end of March I had exams coming up and like a few deadlines you studied um, it's a marketing marketing, business, yeah. marketing yeah um, so I had a few exa- I had like four exams I think coming up um when are they in draw they were meant to be in may may and maybe like one in june yeah um so they were coming up so it was like starting to you know revise for that and whatnot mm-hmm. and then a couple i think i had my like major assignments so i didn't actually choose to do a dissertation because mm-hmm. of the course i could do a thing called like brand portfolio where you it's like a dissertation you basically create a brand and then 
present it and then like write about it. So it's uh-huh. it's more interesting, I think. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was around that time. I was in my student house and I think maybe the week before they announced lockdown, me and my girlfriend went to Wales to her parents and we were there for a bit. Um, and it was like getting pretty serious, but that whole Boris Johnson's like announcement on the TV hadn't happened yet. And this was a week before lockdown? Yeah, before oh, this is like a week before they announced it, I think. Okay. But you'd, you'd already gone to your girlfriend's? We were, so we were in the student house, but we were like, well, let's just go there for a bit, see what okay. happens. Okay. Um, I don't really know why. I've, there must have been a reason, but we were like, let's just go there okay. for a few days, yeah, yeah. see what happens. Yeah. Um, and I remember as well, my house, like, when we left, my housemates were like, oh, we'll see you in a few days, like lockdown's not going to happen. Like, they were kind of in denial almost, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were just like, no, what's going on? Like, yeah. Um, and then whilst we were there, I spoke to my parents who live in a different part of Wales and they were like, look, if lockdown's going to happen, like, you, can't, you can't come back here because they're high risk. Yeah. Or they said, like, I could come back, but it would mean spending like however long just stuck inside. Like, they yeah. didn't leave. So I was okay. like, do you know what? Probably not. Okay. Um, and we went back to Leicester. And then, uh, talk to me about that because you mentioned that your parents are high risk. Like how much, how did that affect things in terms of choosing where your time, choosing where to spend your time? Cause I guess that was a big deal or a big yeah. decision to make. Well, I, I didn't, it's kind of like, I didn't have a choice really. Um, I could, the, the two options. So my parents are divorced as well. Okay. But so my dad and stepmom high risk and okay. then my mum's not, but my stepdad is like massively high risk. So okay. both of them were just like yeah. out of the picture. Yeah. So it was between staying in Leicester, yeah, um, quite potentially on my own in like the student house, yeah, or go back to my girlfriend's. So yeah. it was kind of like a no-brainer, really. Yeah. Um, and that's what we did. Yeah. So lockdown got announced. We had to come back to Leicester to get our stuff because when we went the first time, like that week before, we didn't really take much with us because, yeah, of course, I guess we were naive and thinking that it weren't going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had to come back to Leicester and get all our stuff basically like get clothes and I remember packing my suitcase and my girlfriend was like you need to bring your decks like I've just got a little mixer yeah yeah. and I was like it's not gonna be that long like it would be fine and she's like no (laughs) like you need to bring them because you'll have nothing to do otherwise (laughs) bearing in mind they like her parents live in like proper rural Wales like north of Wales small village it's like it's amazing yeah countryside everywhere yeah yeah. it's not like I can just nip to the nip to the shop like no shop near you like (laughs) okay proper middle of nowhere yeah yeah. and so she was like you need to bring them Uh, the thing is like i know exactly what you mean so i i got family in germany and i go stay there sometimes they live in the middle of nowhere like there's nothing so um i don't get me wrong i love staying there it's amazing scenery and maiden walks but there's definitely times where you're there for maybe a week or a few days you think right what do i do now like (laughs) looking around yeah yeah (laughs) especially if the the internet's crap as well that's even worse right (laughs) so that was like i guess we'll touch on it in a bit in terms of uni work but that's another thing i like i don't want to sound like um i'm moaning because i'm i was lucky to even have like somewhere to stay like obviously there's people in this situation that probably didn't have anywhere or like we're stuck in a flat with no garden and one thing that I'm really like thankful for is the fact we could go outside. Yeah. It was that much of the middle of nowhere that we went like two, three days, maybe even a week without seeing anyone else mm. just apart from the family. So it's like mm. the whole hour outside thing. I was so lucky to, to essentially not have that like forced on me because we could yeah. be in their garden, but also their garden was like a massive mountain behind yeah, the house. Yeah, yeah. You can go wherever you want. There's yeah. no one going to tell you like, Oh yeah, go back inside. Yeah, There's yeah. no one around anyway. <laughs> exactly. No one's around. I ain't going to pass the virus to anyone if I've got it. So it's cool. <laughs> Um, so I mean like incredibly lucky for that yeah um, but it also meant internet issues and trying to finish my degree with like and up until this point we didn't know what was happening with our exams as well um, yeah. that it was still like up in the air with the uni and what time was this where I can imagine like it was getting close to it and you didn't really know what was going on so you don't really know what to plan for as well yeah for sure so that was yeah, so when was like that? It was like the start, of, end of Middle March, of March, wasn't it? I Middle of March, yeah. Yeah, it was like 17th of March because I remember because of Sophie. So this was been about April. I think start of April when they told us what was going to happen with okay. our exams and they got changed to coursework. Okay. But So they told us, but then it was still another like two, three weeks until we knew what the questions were that we had to like write about. Yeah. So that was a really weird time, just like... Would that be the same for a lot of people or was it quite different for everyone? Of how? I think it might be the same for a lot. Like, obviously it differs between unis. Yeah. But speaking to a lot of my friends, that was kind of like the same vibe. Okay. 
I know some people ended up doing their exams just online and it like changed the way they did it. Like obviously they had books and stuff. Yeah. But I think for the most part, a lot of students had their exams changed to like written essays and stuff. Okay. So That's interesting. I think. If you had your exam, like, do you have to be on like a web cover and stuff like that? I don't, I think. Because I had, I, I did an exam recently that was, it was uh, just like an alcohol course just for the bar <laughs> and stuff like that. And I had to be like, it was live on webcam and I couldn't look anywhere. Like if you wow. looked somewhere else, they thought you was cheating. Mad. And someone's watching you. <laughs> wow. No, I don't think so. You know. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure. Cause luckily I didn't have to do that, but going back to the internet thing, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Mm. So because it was rural Wales, their internet is based off like phone signal. So, you know, like it's called like a MiFi box. Sounds like dial up to me. Bro, it <laughs> felt like dial up. <laughs> dial up connection. You, you basically put a SIM card, phone SIM card into like a, a router. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's what gives you your Wi Fi, like based off 4G. But yeah, because yeah. they live in the middle of nowhere, like there isn't really a 4G connection. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, so, you have to like, trek up to the top of the mountain yeah, and do your work up there. Literally, <laughs> literally. So, um, they were trying to do like the last three Romanian lectures online. I got nowhere. I think I, I managed to do one outside. <laughs> I just like, got some weird picture ahead of you, like trekking on some mountain and you're waterproof, setting up like some, like, you know, like the tents where like the fishing people use. Yeah, yeah. And just sitting underneath there with your laptop or something. No, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> I'm, I managed to get one and then it just like, just wasn't really working. But yeah. um, lecturers were good. Like you could arrange for them to to call you and stuff but then again like i had the issue with phone signal so yeah i'd have to arrange a call and then make sure i walked up like i say mountain now <laughs> so i walked up the side of the hill to get phone signal it's to call them. so mad <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know looking back like it was i don't know how i got through it like and not again like i felt so lucky to even have a roof over my head but yeah yeah, yeah. It, it's insane how much you like rely on the internet and yeah, and yeah. technology to do the work for uni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if I didn't have internet, I couldn't have done it at all. So I'm glad I even had like a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And there was one point where I was thinking of deferring like what I had left. Yeah. And um, one of the lecturers who like helped me a lot, she said like, you know, I'll help you defer if you want, like you've got a, you know, a valid reason. Yeah. Um, but the uni were quite good with that. Like I made the head of my course um, clear like what my situation was and everyone was like really understanding. So that was like a good thing on their part, yeah. I think. Yeah, definitely, for sure. For sure. So you just kind of like spoke about um, a lot during as well. So I guess what I want to know is what difficulties do you find right now? So you've talked about um, doing your exams and... I guess a lot of worries, like even without lockdown and without COVID, it's the scary part of what's next. Yeah, for sure. And what do you do right now? Because I mean, I speak to so many different students, all at different levels, all with different career paths. And um, some people know exactly what they want to do. Some people have got an idea. Some people haven't got the foggiest. Yeah. Um, and I guess during this time, it just heightens those anxieties maybe, um a lot worse of not knowing what's next because i guess like jobs are harder to find internships and all the rest of it so tell me where you're at right now in terms of the world of progressing after uni okay um i'll go to start it like, i guess i'll go back to like in lockdown yeah so like kind of like uh what would it be like may june yeah so i think my the the first thing was like the shift of my uni grade change. Um, and that was just down to the situation, like all throughout uni, I, I, maybe like first, second year, I wasn't too bothered, but then I started getting like good grades and I thought, okay, like I can leave uni with a first, like, you know, yeah. um, and that was set to happen. And then we went into lockdown and I thought, Do you know what, as long as I pass, like that's cool with me now. Cause, yeah. cause of the, just the situation. And to give a little bit more context, um, I just brushed over it. The house we were in so it was me my girlfriend her mum stepdad and two brothers and it's not like the biggest of houses so my girlfriend's not even got her own room so we took her younger brother's room over okay and then her two brothers had to share the wi-fi would only work in the kitchen so you had me her mum and her 
two brothers trying to do like he was her older brother's in college and a younger brother's in school all in the kitchen trying to do work so it was like just not like the ideal place to do work because yeah, there were yeah. so many distractions going yeah. on so i just set my goals a bit lower in terms of like my grade at first that must um, have been difficult to kind of accept that yeah it was out it's out of your control that was it though that it took me a while to come to terms with but yeah that's it it was like especially you know if your grades were good because i know that beat me up because yeah you know what i mean it's, it's it's a shit feeling yeah my grades were good like it was kind of set for a first and then i just had to sit down and think like look i'm doing the best i can and i might not get a first and that's fine um and i think also it's difficult there's a big thing of like comparing to your friends and a lot of my mm. friends are in a little bit more of a fortunate situation like you know at their home great internet things like that mm. which contributes to be able to do work easily and um so yeah and i th- I remember that brand portfolio i was talking about which is like the version of our dissertation mm-hmm. so in lockdown i got the grade back for that and for the presentation i did whilst bef- like before lockdown i had like 84 which is like a high first okay and then the written part of it i got 60 something so it's like a 2-1 okay and obviously 2-1 is still like an amazing grade yeah. but it was at that moment where I was like, okay, I think I need to lower my bar a bit and yeah. it's out of my reach. Like it's, I'm still doing the best I can, but it's a completely different situation yeah, now. Yeah. Um, so that was like a big thing. And then obviously I've got to focus on job, getting a job. Did and you knew that was like kind of looming in the background and... Yeah, for sure. I mean, I started applying for jobs before um, COVID happened. Yeah. Like in uni but not nothing too serious. Like it was more just seeing what's about like, Oh, that's a cool company. I'd like to wait for apply for that. But it was never really like that much of a focus. It was more on finishing. Um, and then, yeah, I remember doing like my last essay and thinking like, what do I do now? Mm. And I also remember seeing like loads of things in the news about unemployment rising. Yeah. And I just thought like, shit, what am I going to do? I don't know. Yeah. Can I swear, by the way? I don't know. Swear as much yeah. as you want. Sweet. I think, I don't know. <laughs> I, don't I don't know. know everyone gets censored if we put it up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But yeah, I just thought like, what am I going to do? Because it's such a weird climate to get a job in. Yeah. And not many people would be hiring and like all these worries start to go around. And I was like, I don't even know where I'm going to live because I can't go home mm. because my parents are high risk. And my unit this was still like probably may time i yeah. think i was having all these like thoughts mm-hmm. and i had my uni house until end of june so yeah. i was like right i can go back there for a little bit yeah and in that space of now having no work to do just use that to try and get a job yeah. and that's what i did but it took way longer than expected yeah what to find a job yeah to find a job what you came back to leicester i came back to leicester so um all my housemates did we basically were like do you know what? This is so shit now. I think it was when they were starting to ease things a little bit. Yeah. We were like, okay, let's go back to Leicester. We'll have the house till the end of June. Yeah. And then the three boys in my house, me and two others, all of our birthdays are in June. So okay. we're like, fuck it. Let's just go back. Yeah. First of June, all went back and just had like three weeks of just getting pissed. And, and like, it, was, it would have been, is it 21st or it would have been 22nd? 22nd, okay. yeah. Um, but we just were like, let's just have them three weeks to have a bit of fun and like, our send off in a way because we knew we weren't going to get like a proper one yeah, yeah so we just used that as like a time to apply for jobs in the day and then just drink at night and just fair enough bro we were <laughs> doing all sorts we had like two two tvs in the living room xbox set up <laughs> we had like place we got bust out of playstation 2 got singstar <laughs> the lot man we were just living the life for them three weeks because we knew it was about to end and Wait, it was just like you gotta appreciate those moments like if i look back now and think about when was the best years of my life it was 100 percent when I was 22, like yeah. 22 was the age that like I was partying every week, week in, week out. And I miss those days. So yeah, like it was good that you did that and you went yeah. back, I think. Um, so yeah, from June, you've gone back. What happened towards the end, like of leaving? Um, because your tendency would have come, to, come up to an end. Yeah, so the, the tendency was ending on like the 26th of June or so, around then. Um, like I say, we were just chilling, um, having like little parties, we went on Beard Park, playing some like cricket, just making the most of it. Um, Tenancy ends and my mum has to come pick me up. And like, honestly, 
I don't know. It's so weird. Like it's it's obviously weird leaving uni anyway. Yeah. I think there's that's a whole thing of like post uni depression that people don't talk about quite yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I didn't. I never thought of it really. Like obviously, uni's like the the best years of your life. Yeah. Or one of. Yeah. And it just comes to an end like so abruptly. Yeah. And um, I know there's a difference between like I'm just thinking about like all the um, even though I've never been part of uni. I get to see it from everyone that leaves every single year. Yeah. Um, so I've seen it from uh, the people that I first kind of used to meet when I was around 21, just before I started B-Swing. And it was weird knowing that I'd just become friends with people and they're leaving. And I've seen what they went through. And then obviously when I started B-Swing and I got to know the reps every single year, once yeah. I know for three years since they leave, and then it's like, and then the, the same thing happens next year. I and mean, you start to become really good friends with someone, for, even for, for example, like yourself, like yeah. who has there been for like Selkin, for example, like all these kind of people, like it's mad. Yeah. Um, but to have it like during COVID, like talk me through that. That's the thing. Yeah. So you have those feelings anyway, but I think it just, what just are those added feelings? to it. Man, those feelings. So like, I remember thinking like you, you make such good friends with people mm-hmm. and just ending uni, like without COVID, you're like, shit, like, am I still going to see them? Like, are we still going to be mates? Yeah. Uh, like, you know, I don't want to grow old and just like be boring and not do anything. Like these were the times, like these years were the best years I've had. Yeah. And so I was worried about that. And then with COVID, I think that just adds to it because I know I'm not going to see them for a long time because we yeah. have to stay in our house. Yeah. And like, we can't go mixed with households or we can't have more than six people yeah a pub or whatever so like it just added to that worry of like not not seeing my friends and like connecting them with them for a long time and it just yeah it, it definitely affected me like I remember my mum picking me up and I, I was like oh, this is so sad like this is so shit but uh, in my head I was like I'm not gonna cry because <laughs> it's like it's it's all right it's fine and then I remember just like my mates came to the door my housemates and I was the first to go and like one of the girls started crying and I was just like shit <laughs> <laughs> and the tears just came man it's, yeah. it's such a weird feeling and i think the thing that no one prepares you for it yeah like anyway on top of covid which is just worse yeah no one prepares you for that feeling and like no one really talks about it that much and i think they should talk about it more talk about the end process of even uni yeah definitely the effects of it it what comes are- so abruptly that's that's the thing like you're on such a high and then it just ends. Are you talking about like just in general or with COVID? But well, I guess your only experience is with COVID. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, both. Heightened. Both. I think it's just, I think all COVID did was heighten it. Yeah. Because it gave me that like, if you're with, without COVID, it's like, oh, when am I going to see my mates? Hopefully. Well, you, know, you still would have seen a lot of your friends. I guess there's still loads of people that you still haven't seen. Yeah, oh, so many. So yeah. many. Because like you have graduation and then like you go on a night out and you'll bump into so many people because yeah. they're all back in Leicester because you graduated that yeah. day or like the same week or whatever. Mm. And like, we're not probably, we're probably not going to get that. I yeah. don't know when I'm going to see like half the people I've made such good friendships with. Yeah. Just because of the situation. Like I can't just go and mm. hop on a train and go see like my mates yeah. or we can't go to the pub because there's like 10 of us and only six of us can go on a table or whatever. Like it's, it's, cra- it's crazy. Mad. I think that's why like, um, I, if you remember when I put that post out on B-Swang, yeah. I think it was kind of like, even for myself, um, that end of year event is kind of like a goodbye from B-Swang. So it's kind of like, kind of like tying in. So just so it's like, it's a goodbye from us as well. When all those like-minded people, we can put them in, in a room together. Yeah. So be like, oh, this is, the, this is the last part here. This is before it. You go, <laughs> before you all go home. And it was a shame that we didn't have that because I guess that would be the night that everyone kind of comes together definitely um, for that last one so i i, I understand that like, b swang's role in that as well like over then obviously everyone else just normal say their goodbyes but i feel like i also have like i always like, have like some kind of i feel like i've got some kind of commitment to put on that show for example yeah. so that's when i kind of put out that message on the social and say look like um i can't remember exactly what i said but i think like it was just more of what B Swang means to a lot of people and how it ties in the year together. Um, and hopefully we can have an event together that brings some kind of closure to bring those people together. Um, so like, hopefully like the first B Swang back, like a lot of people do come back to it. Like that's what I'm hoping. I'll be there for sure. Anyway. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that a lot of yeah. other people think that as well. And um, 
like I, I want to do like our fest, first festival like some soon I, I know that's been on the cards for a while so that could be a possibility but obviously there's no timeline of when things can get back to normal which is the hardest thing <laughs> yeah it's it's so hard to like wrap your head around yeah I just can't I don't know I thought about it so much and it's like I can't I can't I don't want to sound depressing but I can't see an end to it yeah anytime soon yeah. I've had friends that like, yeah, 2021, like it'll be better. We're going to be starting 2021, like <laughs> lockdown, yeah. New Year's Day, in bed, 10 o'clock. <laughs> it's mad. <laughs> like, when have we known it to ever be like this? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, it is mad. Um, and obviously, like, I hope it does get yeah. better soon, but I think we've got a long way yet, for sure. Well, as we carry on in the podcast, what I want to do is um, lead up to talk about how we can come out of it on the positive side. Um, so going from leaving, uh, uni or coming to the end of your tenancy, speak about maybe from June onwards. And it, I mean, it still might not have been a good time. Uh, so taught me from like, did you go back to Wales to your family's house? Yeah. So no. So I'll basically, I, when I got picked up from my mum, and at this point is when the, the restrictions were easing up a bit. Okay. And so... I went back to my mum's in Nuneaton okay. with my stepdad who was like high risk. Okay. And we talked about it for, and you know, like we came to the conclusion, it'll be all right. I just have to be like sensible. I can't go out yeah. to pubs all the time, or whatever. And I yeah. can't do this and that, but I needed a place to stay. We'd been throughout lockdown at my girlfriend's in North Wales for like two, three months. And they, they didn't have like the room for us. And I want to say like, they were amazing throughout it. Like, I'm so thankful to them for like letting me stay there at their house and feeding me and like giving me somewhere to stay. And we got on amazing. Like it was, it was a really nice experience to feel like I've got to know my girlfriend's parents and like her family a lot better. Was it the first time that you meeting them as well? No, no. So I've, I've met them loads of times, okay. but you know, you've been like, together? Oh, coming up like three years, I think. That's a long time then. Yeah. But it's different. It's different. Like yeah, obviously it's, it's, it's different one thing. Together, yeah, man. Like it's one thing go and see them for the weekend. But then when we, when we were like living together yeah, and obviously we weren't going anywhere. So it was literally just that, like us, the whole family <laughs> yeah. day in, day out. Like, yeah. but it was nice. Like we proper got to know each other and stuff. So I, I really like appreciate that time. That's one thing I'm like grateful for. That's really it. nice. I like yeah. that because generally like it's, it's a difficult situation when you don't get along with their parents or there's not kind of a connection there. And it's great that you did. Yeah. I'm assuming that you still go out when you're still boyfriend, girlfriend. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, still, still, yeah, it's, no, it's all good. It's all together. Um, but yeah, so I ended up going back to my mum's in Anita. Um, and the plan was just hit hard on getting a job, like apply to anything and everything. How many jobs do you think you applied for? Bro, I've got a list. I could probably pull out on my phone over a hundred. <laughs> no easy, way. Easy, Why have you got easily. a list? Cause so I was like, it got to the point where I was applying for so many jobs. Yeah. The next day I'd go on, on LinkedIn or on Indeed Show or whatever. Show me this list, I want to see this Bro, list. I'll get it out. <laughs> but so, so not all the jobs I applied for are on this list, but the reason I made it is because I'd find myself going on LinkedIn or Indeed yeah. and forgetting which jobs I'd applied for and like, yeah. I'd reapply for jobs or something because <laughs> I, I was just applying to everything, man. Oh, I'm going to find this list. I'll tell you something that's mad. So we put a job advert for a glass collector for Sophie. So if you didn't know, Sophie is a cocktail bar and venue that I opened up four weeks before lockdown. Really unlucky, but yeah. Anyway, so we're out of lockdown. Um, we started on minimal staff and we needed a glass collector. We put it out on Indeed. Within two days, we had 200 applications. Mad. <laughs> in two days. Like, they're coming in, like, by the minute, I'm just getting email notifications on my phone, like, what is going on? <laughs> it's mad. But So this is the list, and it just goes, Let's have a look, man. let's have a look. It's so, just yeah. absolute goes, like, and that, they're definitely not all on there, because I, apply, I was applying for jobs before, like, lockdown even happened, and then I was applying for, like, loads of jobs before I even made that list, so... And I think it's easy, like, relative like, to what you want to do though. It's not like, I don't know, just like yeah. a random. And if they've got a, if they've got a shit emoji next to them, it means they either didn't get it back or they said no. Okay. But yeah, there was like, I uh, easily over a hundred, I think. Did you ever get any feedback? Do you ever get feedback from these? Like once, once. So I heard back from a few, but it was just straight up like no or whatever. Yeah, or like yeah. the, the big one was we've hired someone with more experience and that yeah. just doesn't say a lot. Yeah. And it was very like, well, I can't get experience if you're not going to give me a job. Yeah. Um, but there was one guy, um, it was a marketing agency in London, actually. And he basically called me back and he called me and said, you hadn't got the job, 
but they liked me and it was the usual with giving it someone more experience. Um, but he, he, gave, he was like, if you're ever in London, here's my number, here's my email, let me know. Uh, and he was just like, he started asking me questions like, what do you want to get into? So I had a bit of a chat with him and he, he gave me some feedback on it. He said like, I interviewed well um, and it was just, just a case of someone applied with a bit more experience. Yeah. So they got the job. Um, but he started giving me all this information. He was like, well, look at this place. And actually quite crazy. He got me into contact with someone at Red Bull. Okay. Um, during the interview, I mentioned that they were like a dream sort of company. Yeah. I'm um, into like extreme sports, the music side of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then it, it happened to be that his, I think it was his daughter-in-law okay. is like big in the marketing team there. Okay. And he was like, here's his emails, contact them, use her name. Yeah. And that was like having months of people just say no. Yeah. I was, I was just like blown away. I was like, how are you not giving me a job, but you're giving me all this help. Like, yeah. And, and it was, it was really nice. Um, and nothing's really materialized from that. I mean, I spoke to some people there, but they're not hiring and whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was just that one guy. Everyone else didn't really give any feedback or anything like that. It was just, and I don't blame them. Like it's a mad time and they probably yeah, had, yeah. like you say, with Sophie, hundreds of people. For a glass collector. Yeah, exactly. And you can imagine like, I assume out of a lot of those people, a lot of them are probably people with like degrees and big qualifications and experience in yeah. fields that, do you know what I mean? But just because it's, there's so many people that are unemployed, like people need the work and they need the money. Do you know yeah. what I mean? To live. I had a friend um, and she said she applied for a, a graduate job. So like, obviously it's clues in the name, like they're hiring graduates. Mm. And she got the call back to say she didn't get it. And she asked the woman some questions. And apparently the woman said there were people that weren't graduates that were like ex marketing managers that applied for the role. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they got it because yeah. it's a no brainer because the salary is pretty low. Yeah, yeah. And if you've got, if you're an ex marketing manager yeah. and you're after that, like, why would you not take that yeah, for, yeah, a, yeah. for, you're yeah. getting amazing experience for yeah. such low pay. Yeah, yeah. So I don't blame companies, but it just put us students in such like a shit position. Mm, for sure. Um, so you're at the point where, so this was like June time. Yeah. So where has much changed from then? Like what's happened? Where are we now? We're in October. So talk to me about August, September. Time. Yeah. So I moved out of my mum's, it was me and my girlfriend at my mum's, by the way. Yeah. Um, she came to stay. Um, and we moved out. I'm trying to think when it was, it was maybe like. August or maybe like around end of July, August. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have like a, a empty house within the family that we could stay at, um, like towards Manchester way. Mm -hmm. um, so we were like, right, we'll go there. And when I'm trying to think, cause I know I gave myself this goal of like, I need to get a job before furlough ends. Yeah. Cause I've been following the news quite a lot. And I know that like the statistics are saying like, unemployment is bad now, but wait until furlough ends. And cause obviously, companies were getting covered by the government to pay staff, but then they wouldn't have that. So they'd have to let people go. Yeah. And I knew it was just going to rise even more. And so I just gave myself this, this goal. Like I kept on saying, like, I need to get a job before furlough ends. Otherwise it's just going to be 10 times harder and it's already so hard. So I just, I, I don't know. I, nothing really changed. I just went every day applying for jobs. Mm -hmm. And luckily I got one. Um, I can't even, I, mean, I must've been there. I'm, I've been there a month. Next week. Okay. So where's this? Is in Manchester? Yeah. It's a Manchester based marketing agency. Okay. Um, how did you pull this off? I don't know. I honestly don't know. So how did you apply? Like, how did you apply? Yeah. Um, so they were advertising, I think on Indeed. Okay. Um, applied, had one Zoom interview. Was you, is it, was this a period of just where you was applying for loads of different jobs again? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I always like, I, it was a weird time. I was applying for jobs, all like marketing base of what I want to do. Yeah. And for a while it was very much just creative industries. Yeah. But then I had to lower my standards of like, okay, let's just kind of go, not go for anything. Like it's something I still wanted to do, but in industries that I might not like as much or. Yeah. Because obviously there was only so many jobs I could apply for. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I applied, got an interview, which was just like a quick 20 minute Zoom one. Um, I think they like, obviously they must've had so many people apply. They were just trying to filter out yeah. who was actually right or not. Um, so it was more of like a chat than an interview. Yeah. Um, 
And then I got through to the next stage, which was another, another Zoom interview, but this one was more formal and a lot more like an actual interview. Yeah. And I, I mean, it went really well. Um, and I was waiting to hear back. I don't think it was too long, to be fair. It, must, it couldn't have been longer than like a couple of weeks. Is it a full-time job? Yeah, full-time job. Um, it's a, bit, it's a bit, bit different. So they basically called me and said, we really liked you, but someone with more experience got the role you applied for. Okay. So I, at that point, I was like, okay, I've not got anything. But yeah. And then the, the, the lady was so nice. She just said, but we really liked you and we don't want to let you go. So we've made a position for you for six months and we'll see how it goes. And she was yeah. like, I don't want you to look at it as a six month position because yeah. hopefully by the end of it, we'll keep you on. Yeah. But they just didn't want to like let me go. Yeah. Which was really nice. Like they didn't really, have to really do that. Opportunity. Yeah, for sure. So talk to me um, about, I guess, what I wanted to kind of, the way to conclude this podcast is talk about what we can do um, after. How do we uh, create closure from the case of the your friendship side of things and also how to get into the world of work because obviously I speak to a few different students and yeah. they're still stuck in this situation of trying to find a job or they're not really sure of, so some people listening they might still not know not even know what they want to do and I guess in your case like you've maybe just been consistent with applying and I guess that can be demotivating after a while as well so I there were times where I was just like like why am I bothering yeah it's it's easy when you're like constantly getting rejections or like the worst thing a company can do is not even like give you an answer. Mm -hmm. And I know that, like you said, again, with Sophie, 200 applicants for a glass collector, like, so <laughs> a marketing job where students have just graduated yeah. must be getting like thousands. And so I understand months. it, yeah, but yeah. at the same time, it's so like demoralizing because yeah. you might, you might put loads of effort into that application and to hear nothing back, you're just like, okay, great. Like, what do I do now? So there was a, there was so many times where I thought like I'll just give up I'll just wait. Can I give my two pence of how of my advice of how to get into it? Go for it. Go into the world of work. So I think what you just said about like um, them giving you a position of six months. Um, I think what I, if I was in that position right there is I know I've got six months to bring value to the company. Yeah. So let's say, for example, you wasn't given that position and I was, I didn't really know, maybe I wanted to get into music or I just like the music industry. Maybe I did something completely not related to music whatsoever at uni. I did something like politics, but I, like, I wanted to get into the world of music. Um, what I would suggest and what I have suggested to other people is make a list of all the different companies in music industry and all the different departments of what you could potentially uh, train in because there's so many different parts parts to it. You've got agent, uh, booking agencies, you've got PR companies, yeah. you've got record labels, you've got distribution companies, all the rest of it. Um, and see if you can get in one of them and volunteer. Like, I can't recommend enough volunteering to gain in that experience. Like yeah. really do not think, like I understand that money is a big important thing and you have to value it yourself. But I just believe that volunteering in something in an industry where you don't know or have no experience in and gaining that experience is so important. Definitely. And once you do that, then you gain and you start to gain value in yourself because you've got the experience that's when you can go and approach companies or yeah. even with the company that you work for. So let's say, for example, the situation that you're in now is it's about creating that value to your company. So you need to be thinking of ways of like, right, how can I make sure that whatever I'm bringing into the company covers my wage first yeah. and foremost? So they've, so they've got all the intention of keeping me. Mm -hmm. Then how can I take it further above that so I can keep on progressing and learning and maybe getting a bigger salary and maybe be in a position where if I did want to move to another company or a different style of marketing, I've got the, the ability to do so. Yeah, I'd like to add to that. And I almost forgot to mention it, but so you say about like volunteering, but yeah. also you could do it, you could do it yourself. Like you could start something. 100%, and that's so, how I started. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> and I don't know if, I've not spoke too much about it. I don't know if you know, but so, and this was just like a little thing over lockdown, me and my mate started. We've started a little Instagram account called DMB Valley. And it was okay. literally yeah, just yeah, to pro that. yeah, so it was just to promote Welsh DJs, and like it started with one night in lockdown, my mates were on Zoom, and they made an Instagram account to live stream them DJ, like they were learning to DJ, and then 
we were like, we could do something with this. And I saw it as an opportunity to like, I know I want to work in the music industry eventually, but I can't get a job right now because it's really hard. But if I got the backing of this, like, look, I've done this off my own back. Uh, like it was with friends. It, it gives me something to show that like I've done something in the music scene and in the yeah. music industry in the long run. So I think, yeah, if you, even if you can't volunteer for a company, there's no harm in just like starting your own little thing. And it doesn't have to be the most successful thing in the world. No. Like, it doesn't have to have millions of plays. It doesn't like if, if you then go to an interview and a company can see that you've done it with passion and like you've done it well, then it, it will put you miles ahead of someone else that doesn't have any experience. hundred percent agree. hundred percent agree. Um, yeah, it just reminds me of when I started B-Song when I was 22 and I only started getting a hundred people after about a few months I got offered a job into it in a club and I was Mad. just like, what? Like offered a, offered a full time job, just promoting. Yeah. And, I, Sick. and uh, I didn't take it. I was like, I'm just happy doing my own thing. But um, yeah, it was mad. Like something similar to that situation. Yeah. Like you don't know what's going to happen off the back of um, just trying, I guess. Yeah. Like just trying different things. Um, I think the most important part in the journey of when you are in your 20s is just consistently learning. And it is difficult to kind of, I guess like it's, you have that urge. And I definitely, I had that urge when I was younger. Whereas... I want to make money. Yeah, yeah I want yeah. a nice car. Yeah, I need to be saving for a house and all the rest of it. But traveling, traveling. Even though we cannot do that <laughs> no more, that's not happening. But it's like you have all these ideas in your head. You're like, you want to be really successful, but I think people lot put a lot of pressure on themselves. Yeah. And um, when I look about the journey of Beastman, it's probably been only the past four years where I've been financially successful. And mm -hmm. the first four years before that it was completely not like that. I was, even though some of the events were successful, but we wasn't charging that much for tickets and the events are maybe one or two months in between. Yeah. So it's not like a lot to live off. Um, and sometimes you lose money on events as well, as well. So yeah. it's difficult, but I think it's important to learn as much as you can in your twenties, which is why I recommend um, volunteering in a sector if you're not experienced in that sector. Yeah. I mean, so just to like, as a bit of an example, so doing that DMV Valley, all it is is we just got Welsh DJs that we don't know, like from Instagram to do a 30 minute mix and we've uploaded it to the SoundCloud and that it's gone quite well. And out of that, that's the experience I've got in the music industry. It helped me to get an interview with Sony Music. Okay, wicked. Um, and I like, before that, I mean, Beast Fang's on my CV and that's yeah. like, music related but Sony Music aren't going to know what that is and in the application process that the, all their application process was is like CV cover letter but then a few questions and they were all around the music industry and what you've done for it mm -hmm. and if I hadn't have started this DMB Valley thing I wouldn't have had anything to put there other than I've sold tickets for b -Swang, which is like I'm so happy with that like, I mm. love b -Swang, but yeah. to them that's probably not going to be like much it's not yeah, going to yeah help me get a job interview what was um, the job role for um so it was it was a marketing like not placement what do you call it um what's it like a internship yeah uh, paid um for columbia records yeah um i haven't actually heard back from them yet i had the interview a while ago now um so i'm taking it as a no but i've got a job so it doesn't really matter anymore <laughs> but i mean it would have been cool um but just uh, like i know a few people that applied for it that didn't get an interview so I was happy with even getting it. And I, I think it is purely down to the fact that I started, you know, on top of B-Swang, I started this, this DMB Rally thing off like me and my mates off our own back and we've done it consistently. And, and I think they might've seen that. And cause we had to put like links into it what we were talking about. Like it yeah. shows that you're willing to do something that not a lot, of, not a lot of people might do. And that's exactly one of the reasons, one of the ways I started B-Swang, like you start something just for a fun, just see how it goes. And then yeah. you just keep it on, on from there and it, this, just keep it consistent. You keep on learning and do what you got to do, I think, I guess. But do you, are you going to continue with d &B Valley? Like what are you doing with it right now? Like, are you still, is it just a learning process at the moment? Is it still going? You yeah, still yeah, it's still going. So there's, there's a few of us to be fair. So yeah. there's, there's like, four or five I don't, I don't know it's like so there's me and a girl called jess who's like one of my girlfriend's best mates started it with her and her boyfriend and then we're lucky enough that one of our friends is like an app developer so he built a website for us so okay. he's involved 
Um, and again, like it was literally just for fun. Like they love the music, I love the music. And we realized that like, there's quite a big scene in Wales, yeah. but not, no one really shouts about it. Yeah. Um, and so, we, and we've had like such a good response of, of people messaging our page being like, yo, I'm, I'm from Cardiff or I'm from Newport, like can I do a mix? Um, so we're just still quite consistently putting a mix out every week. I think we're on like week 18. Um, and then also a couple of people sent us some songs that they were like, just put this on for a free download if you want. So that's, that's been pretty cool. Um, I think we're just going to keep it like that. Like we've, there's no plans. It's just, yeah. it was literally just something to keep us occupied during lockdown. Um, and it went like reasonably all right. Sick. Um, just before we end the podcast what would you say to graduates that are still looking for work and give them advice on getting closure even if you haven't got it yourself yeah i don't think i've got closure yet you know <laughs> i i don't think I'll ever, I, i'm waiting for that moment i don't know when i'll get closure like yeah this is my first time back in leicester since could I it left. be a b-swing i think so yeah i think it needs you to be a b-swing to be honest B-swing. I don't think anything else will like do it. Like nothing can do it for me. I don't think than a B swang. A B swang. Get all your mates back. Yeah. Get all the people from Uni of Leicester back. DM you. Get everyone together, and that's going to be the big night. That will be it. You reckon? I think so. Okay. This is my first time back in Leicester since I left in June. Okay. So it's quite a while ago, and it's still, like it still feels like I could just be like, oh, I'm just popping to a lecture. Like it's <laughs> yeah, not. It's yeah, not. Yeah. It's it's so weird. Yeah. Um. But advice to students. But in Gosh. terms of like, maybe it's difficult because, um, well, no, I, I wouldn't say it is difficult because you've landed yourself a job. So, yeah. which I'm very grateful for. Like, yeah. So what, I guess like, what advice would you give to someone that is still looking for a job or, think, or, or someone that's getting disheartened? Cause there's going to be someone right now that yeah. doesn't really know what they're doing. Do you know what? Take, like take it in your stride. And I think don't beat yourself up. Like don't blame yourself we're in such a shit situation and it's not easy to get a job. And I think it goes back to that thing of like, no one talks about what happens after uni. Mm -hmm. There's this big sort of like preconception that you, you finish uni, you've got a degree and you can just get a job with, without COVID happening. That's not the case anyway. Mm -hmm. That is not just easy. If COVID, like if COVID wasn't a thing, it's still not easy to get a job. No, of course. And this is just making it harder. So don't blame yourself. Really don't blame yourself. Like, I know I was beating myself up about it, mm -hmm. but it took me a while to realize that actually it's, it really is like massively out of my control. Mm. And there's, there's things you can do to obviously help, like try not to, to give up. And I know it's tough applying to jobs, but just do it regularly if you can. And, and like we say about doing things that will help you stand out. So like create your own podcast, create your own fashion account, like whatever it is you want to get into, like mm -hmm. try and show companies that you, you're into it and you want to do it. But don't put too much pressure on yourself because it's just so hard right now. And, and like you'll just beat yourself up and make yourself feel so down if you don't get anything. And yeah. I think you could be like the smartest person in the world right now. But if, you, if, if company's not hiring, they're not hiring. Like, yeah. just, what can you do? You that's can't do anything. True. That's very true. It's, it's a mad time. But I think that's good, solid advice because, yeah, like I said, like I know there's a lot of people feeling down ab uh, about that and not blaming yourself is a big one. So yeah, I'd probably say from my side, just what I touched on earlier in terms of, um, I'm a big believer in putting on everyone, doesn't matter whether you're a graduate or you're older in life, is do what makes you happy. Yes. <laughs> that is the most important thing. And that's one thing that I've learned over the years is do what makes you happy. Like if you're, um, even if you haven't studied in something that um, is what you want to do and you've got pressure from your parents and saying, no, oh, like you should go be a teacher or something after that. Scrap but it off. You want to, I don't know, go be like a, a world champion in chess or something like that. Go be that world champion in chess. 100%. And um, start creating the stepping stones to that path. Um, so one person that I'm really close with at the moment, uh, she was, has just gone and done something completely different to what she studied at uni. And she's on a very good path now where she's starting to make waves in what she's doing. And I mm. think just what, from what you're saying about DMV 
DMB Valley, it's so important to take those stepping stones because you don't know what what it's going to lead up, lead up yeah, to. Yeah, you don't. Um, and having that experience as well, like, um, it, obviously I can relate because I run a record label and the event yeah. side of things and it's so much more appealing if someone has that little bit about them that knows maybe a, a bit about editing videos or something because I was I was literally on the phone to a PJ this morning and be like, right, like we've got all these projects, like what are we going to do? So we've got yeah. um, marketing we got the marketing for all our projects. We've got the operations and logistics for all our projects or the finance or the creative direction. And between those things, like we was just talking about the marketing part and what each role entails and the marketing side of it. It's, it's not just social media. It, it extends to um, Photoshop and Premiere Pro and mm-hmm. picking up these little bits and skills here and there definitely helps towards your cv because let's say for example you went for that interview in with columbia and you and you're going for this marketing role it's like i'm cool i've used photoshop before i've used this before and i know how to create this piece of content and even though it might not be the best i know how to direct that and brief another graphic designer saying oh can i have it like this Mm-hmm. yeah and 100% those little skills and I, th- I think that's what's helped me over the years with B-Swang so let's say for example like Sonny with a graphic designer I've had experience on Photoshop and all these different things so I can be like oh can you tweak it like this or do it like yeah. this even though he is the full creative person <laughs> I don't want to like dib- like t- touch, on, touch on their um, their skill set there's like a there's like a saying in it I don't know who said it it's just always stuck with me I remember I remember hearing it somewhere and it's like be a sponge yeah so just like for it just sounds similar to what you're saying like take everything in as much as yeah, you can yeah because you don't know when you might need it and like what you can use it for today as well actually so like um he's probably he's a graphic designer and he's primarily focused on a lot of event stuff and music stuff a lot of his work has been with b-swang on records for a long period of time it's probably been a big chunk of um his his money as well mm-hmm. but over the course of the past year or however long like he was saying that he's been focused on websites and when COVID hit, it's helped him while maybe from B-Swang, we've not been able to give him as much money as because he was a freelancer. He's been able to source money from other different ways just because yeah. he's learned different parts now that that obviously has helped him kind of carry on progressing. And yeah, learn as much as you can. Learn loads of different things while you can if you're young. Not even if you're young, do it any age. Well, if you, also like, <laughs> do it any age. And also... Back to that thing of like, what can graduates do? We're still so young. Like I'm 22. Super young. I'm 22. Like <laughs> I was stressing. I would probably didn't need to stress. Like, it, of course we are. Like everyone's going to be stressing right now. Yeah. There's like you say with B-Song not happening, people not having jobs, not knowing where you're living. Like it's a, it's a tough time. So just like, remember that, remember that, like it's hard. And we're young. Like, I don't know where I'm going to be in a year's time, let alone five, 10. 20 like you could be in a completely different place exactly doing something completely different beast might not be my longer and i just might be opening cocktail bars <laughs> <laughs> well i'll take that to be fair <laughs> but yeah just like just touching on that as well like making mistakes is so important mm-hmm. and if i if i could give uh anyone advice from uh beast wang and rec- one records of where i've got to where i've got to i'd 100 number one is make mistakes learn from them but the second one is don't make the same mistake twice <laughs> well, you do, you know, you, yeah if you're doing that you're doing something wrong but if you make a mistake and you learn from it yeah that's like the perfect situation there's been so many times where i've made a mistake from b-swang and it's probably been a huge financial loss as well but then if you ask me would you would you have gone through that again i would say yes every single time yeah because that's what's helped me progress on to the next thing and again yeah i meet so many people that are scared of making mistakes and they beat themselves up about it it's like no like it's amazing that you made that mistake like because you get to learn from that now and get to the next part in life or the next stepping stone of whatever you need to get to if you're doing what you love definitely yeah but i think it's coming up to an hour now wow goes quick i've enjoyed this podcast I've enjoyed seeing you, Justy, of course. I know, it's been long. And uh, taking in your experience, because I guess, like, obviously we haven't spoke to each other in a long while. Apart from um, that uh, game of Among Us the other day. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's, <laughs> that's also another bit of advice. Like, if you're feeling a bit of shit, just go and play some games. Yeah, like, so um, <laughs> So just before lockdown, we've, we was doing B-Swangs, big massive shows, and we just opened up Sophie. And then this happened and I was sitting at home thinking, uh, what, do I do? what am I doing here? 
<laughs> I had no idea. So for the first time in many years, I got the Xbox out and I was playing Call of Duty every yes. day. Like I did not care about anyone. I was just living it. I went like from morning to night and then, it, yeah, it was just a mad time. I learned new skills in lockdown. So in, I, in Wales, when I was at my girlfriend's uh, family home, I learned to slackline. So, you know, like, it's like tightrope walking. Yeah, you know, it's I like, think um, I've seen something on your socials yeah, about it. Um, so, so I did a few things I learned that and then I told myself I was going like, to like mix every more. time I go to the park I, when I see someone do that I think you lot are strange <laughs> nah it's so sick bro it's so fun it's so I mean, fun uh, I mean it's just, it must be super hard to you do you should try it it's pretty hard um, it's just like balance but it was it was just something to do like why not um, so there was that and then I'm, I tried to like mix more because mm. I've always had like a little not decks which is like a little mix track pro whatever it is just like mm. like kicking about and I use it for like parties or whatever so I did a few mixes which I put online and then um, I learned to juggle as well. My girlfriend's mum could juggle, so. Wicked. Learned that, which was pretty fun. Essential life skills, of course. Always. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, conclude the podcast, like, one thing that I'd like to take away is your consistency in applying for jobs, which has got you there in the end. And it, yeah. you did get there in the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I've, I've seen the list of jobs and there were a lot of jobs on there. But I liked that you never gave up and ultimately that's what got you to where you are right now in the opportunity to, to what you have. Yeah, definitely. I think the biggest takeaway will be don't don't give up. Don't beat yourself up because it's hard, but don't give up. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Josty, for coming down, coming to Last Night at Rave Save My Life and... I shall hopefully see you again very soon. Yes, thank you for having me. See you at the next Beast Line. Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> if you wanted to reach out and follow Justy, you can follow him on Instagram at andrewjusty1. Additionally, if you enjoy the podcast and want to listen to more or just want to follow me in general, you can get me on all the socials at Nico the Beardo. Peace out.